You know, there's something about 90s JRPGs that turned the entire genre into its own little time capsule, and I'm pretty sure it all comes down to one emotion, melancholy. No, seriously, try to remember late 16-bit and PS1 JRPGs. Most had melancholic overtones, Final Fantasy, Fantasy Star 4, Tales of Fantasia and Terranigma. Well, maybe Terranigma isn't the best example, because Grandstream Saga is a spiritual sequel to the Soul Blazer series, of which Terranigma is included. The Soul Blazer series was jointly developed by Quintet and Enix of Dragon Quest fame, but the two went their separate ways and Quintet formed a new studio called Shade, though Grandstream Saga is the only game they ever developed. I should also point out that there's an internet myth that Grandstream Saga was based on a manga called Crows. But there's no evidence that this manga even exists, so I think it's fair to say this was made up. Back then, there was a lot of hype for this game in Japan. If the internet is to be believed, it even outsold Final Fantasy VII in Japan for a short time. And Grandstream Saga is often credited as being the first fully 3D JRPG. No pre-rendered backgrounds here, everything here uses polygons. So. With all of this said, how is Grandstream Saga? It's... okay. It's sorta good, but I doubt it'll break into anyone's list of best PS1 JRPGs. Grandstream Saga takes place in a world where a great magical war inadvertently melted the polar ice caps and sunk the world below the water level. As a desperation move, four islands were raised into the skies by magic. But now, centuries later, they are starting to sink back down. You play as Eon, your typical JRPG main character with little to no personality. You have a magical scepter which can copy, create and restore just about everything it touches, including weapons, armors, keys and magical items. And it's your job to reactivate the magic that keeps all islands floating. Along the way you'll meet other characters who help you on your journey, though the main cast is basically just you, Arcea who spends most of the game guilt tripping herself and Laramie, a strong pirate warrior who doesn't actually do anything in the game. Regardless of who joins you, you only ever get to play as Eon, the other characters merely join in during story segments and then promptly disappear. The game foregoes many common RPG mechanics, for example, you don't buy weapons and armor, instead you usually find a broken piece and your scepter restores it for you. Most weapons are automatically given to you by just following the linear story. This essentially makes money useless. Sure, you can buy items, but during my entire playthrough I never bought a single item simply because I didn't need to. You don't gain any experience either, instead you level up at predetermined plot points, which actually makes fighting enemies completely useless. I honestly got to a point where it just made more sense to completely avoid enemy battles. Thankfully, there are no random encounters so you can safely navigate through most dungeons without fighting anyone. Speaking of fighting, these are in real time and always done in one-on-one -on -one battles. To the game's credit, you can't just button mash your way to victory, as foes know when to dodge, block and counterattack. So you have to be on the lookout for openings and learn their attack patterns. To help you, Eon can learn magic and special fighting moves. However, all of the game's battles are incredibly easy. Yes, some may take a while, but that doesn't necessarily make them hard, only tedious. You can learn special moves, but there's really no need to use them. You can take out every single enemy in the game by just waiting for an opening and then attack with a basic 3-hit combo. And as for the magic, I never bothered using any of them outside of the healing spells. You could make the argument that the game rewards skill, but neither the enemies or the bosses require that much skill to beat. To make the game even easier, save points will completely restore your health, and there's a fairly generous number of them too. So again, the game is simply too easy for its own good. Well, ok, so the gameplay isn't the best. But how is the story? Well, it's not bad. It's easily the best part of Grandstream Saga, but it's also highly flawed. As I've mentioned before, JRPGs during this time generally had a melancholic overtone to their plot, and this game pushes it one step further. Every NPC knows the world is ending, and though this isn't readily apparent at first, the more you progress, the more somber the game becomes. 
it gets to a point where even talking to kids is depressing as hell. Like this little girl saying that nature is having its vengeance against humanity and we'll all die soon enough. Jesus Christ kid, lighten up! The entire game shares a similar nihilistic view, which at times can create some really gut-wrenching moments. But then, other times, the game pads out the story with completely unneeded segments that don't add anything to the story or characters. It's like the developers were intentionally trying to lengthen the game as much as possible, but all it really did was give Grand Stream Saga some major pacing issues. The game's story is also complemented with anime cutscenes. These are fairly well animated, though I assume they were made on a relatively low budget. They are pretty common during the first part of the game, but they become less frequent the further you progress through the story. All of the cutscenes are voiced, but the English dub leaves a lot to be desired, especially when it comes to Arcea's high-pitched, nasally voice. Get out of my way! There has to be a non-violent solution to all of this! You might notice that the characters have no face during gameplay. I don't think this was intentional as they have no problem giving them faces during the cutscenes and even adding character portraits. But I feel this, coupled with the slow movements, gave the game an almost dreamlike feel to it. Now with that said, I have a huge problem with the ending. But if you want to avoid any spoilers, click on the purple wizard. Ok, so towards the end, through a series of plot contrivances, you have to choose whether to sacrifice Arcea or Laramie to fight the ultimate evil. If you sacrifice Arcea and choose to stay with Laramie, the pain of everyone you lost forces you and Laramie to part ways for a year as both of you deal with the pain and it all culminates in an emotional reunion. If you sacrifice Laramie, however, the game essentially ends with you traveling back in time before any of this happened. You and Arcea don't recognize each other and it generally comes across as a fairy tale ending. Now, I didn't quite like Arcea's ending as a kid and I didn't quite get why. But now that I'm an adult, I think I can eloquently explain it. This ending is fucking bullshit. So you mean to tell me I just went through hell and back and no one remembers it? Nobody even acknowledges Laramie's death? At least in Laramie's ending, the remaining characters feel grief over losing Arcea. I feel this completely removes any emotional weight the ending might have had. There are no consequences for any of your choices. Not to mention that being sent back in time just raises way too many questions. Like, how do we know the timeline was changed? For all we know, the events from the beginning of the game will happen just as they did before. Give me Laramie's ending any day. Anyway, you are now entering spoiler-free territory. If you clicked on the purple wizard, you came to the right place. Overall, I feel Grandstream Saga is just slightly above average. Admittedly, my biggest issue with the game is in the repetitive gameplay. The plot and characters aren't perfect, they suffer from pacing issues and towards the end of the game it suffers from too many plot points which come out of left field. But despite that, the nihilistic and melancholic tone of Grandstream Saga makes for an interesting story and you do care about what happens to this world and its characters. And the music is really good too. The game has been slowly climbing up in price, but it's not expensive by JRPG standards. If you're into the Soul Blazer series, or if you want to build up your PS1 JRPG collection, this isn't a bad place to start. Just remember, there's a reason this game doesn't usually make into anyone's list of top PS1 games. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stika's Retro Corner. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment and subscribe for a new video every Thursday. If you've got a recommendation, let me know in the comments. Anyway. I hope you have a great day, bye!